A week ago today, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, had a very important photo op with a drone, an Iranian drone. With great glee and great fanfare, the Persian nation announced that it had copied that American drone that crashed in Iran in 2011. An official Iranian news report said the new drones would be able to attack U.S. warships. Whether Iran is bluffing or not remains a question. But the fear of the future of drones is quite real. It is the subject of a new book by well-known former U.S. terror official Richard Clark. The book Sting of the Drone is fictional, but it is inspired by real life. He joined me to talk about the present and future of these killing machines. Richard Clark, pleasure to have you on. Good to be here. So your book uh, begins or has as a central aspect a drone strike and then the sense of vengeance that one of the people who was associated with it, um, one of the targets uh, who survives, uh, ends, up, ends up having. It raises fun this fundamental question that we deal with in Yemen, in Pakistan, in, in, in Afghanistan. Are the drone strikes worth it? Or is the, the sense of rage, outrage, the collateral casualties, is that all, does that all outweigh the benefit of getting this one guy? Well, we began the drone program, the lethal drone program, to get one guy, uh, Bin Laden. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, but the idea was to have a very restricted list of very senior people. And it did kind of work for that. And we had nothing else that worked. And so if you put your, yourself into the, into the mind of the counterterrorism official uh, in the novel or in reality, uh, the counterterrorism official feels the weight of the world on his or her shoulders. They have to stop the next attack. They have to save the lives of Americans. And they look at their quiver, and there are very few arrows, very few arrows that work. And the drones did. So there begins to be a seduction, an addiction. Well, that works. Well, it worked to kill him. Let's do it some more. Well, maybe we should broaden the definition yeah. of who we're going to kill. And, and then you end up, as we are today, having killed probably 2,500 people in five countries. And they all have friends. They all have family. They all have tribe. Uh, and when a program gets that big, it also becomes a phenomenon in and of itself. And so you get protests in the street about the drone program. You raise another uh, issue in the, in the book, which again seems to me part of a very interesting uh, real-life discussion. I mean, the whole book is like that, but one that struck me... In your, in your version, uh, the terrorist organizations are becoming drug cartels and the drug cartels are becoming terrorist organizations mm -hmm. that, you know, partly begun as a, as a necessary way of financing because the U.S. and, and other allies have essentially cut off uh, terrorist financing so effectively, the only way to make money is to go in the drug trade. Poppy in Afghanistan. How real is that? That's very real. And uh, it's Hezbollah. <laughs> Uh, as well, uh, and it's gangs and cartels and tribes uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan that affiliate with al-Qaeda, affiliate with the Taliban. Uh, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars and stashing it in Dubai and other places. Uh, so it's both terrorists financing themselves and drug cartels engaging in associations with terrorists. You talk about the fact that this technology is going to be more widely available, and so we better be careful. Give us a sense. We've heard this for a while. How close are we to China in significant ways using drones? Uh, China's using drones today. They're just not killing people with them. They have a drone that looks remarkably like the Predator, and I suspect it's probably based on uh, Predator drawings that they hacked uh, and stole. Uh, as they do so often. Uh, there are probably 40 nations now that have drones. Three that I know of have used them in lethal operations. That's, so these are armed drones now? These well, so there are three countries that have used armed drones. That's Russia, the United States, and Israel. There are 40-something countries that have drones that could easily put weapons on them. Uh, and now there are companies and, and local governments. And uh, in the United States, it's become a real issue because there are thousands of people who have bought drones uh, and want to use them for real estate purposes and advertising purposes. Uh, and the government rules say you can't fly above 400 feet. Uh, and yet they are, and one almost uh, ran into an airline in, uh, in Florida. So 
we're going to see drones more and more part of our everyday life as we go forward. So we need clearly rules about, about surveillance drones, and that's a national issue, my, my guess is. But at an international level, do you think we could come up with some kind of uh, international treaty that, that sets out exactly what the, you know, the rights and responsibilities are? Otherwise, as you point out, we have killed 2,500 people in five countries yeah. without, you know, I mean, any kind of congressional declaration of war, without even the invocation of some kind of presidential war powers. It's well, if we establish some international norm uh, and said you can do this but you can't do that, if we were the leader of that effort, it would be rather ironic because we're the only ones who would have violated those international norms. Richard Clark, pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Next on GPS, just who are the Chinese and what are their ambitions? That nation of more than 1.3 billion people is certainly not monolithic. We will take you inside China with The New Yorker's Evan Osnos when we come back.